Welcome into another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show where we disrupt the way you think about your business so you can grow and scale effortlessly, which is not really possible in the business world, but we're going to show you how, especially today, we have a fun episode. We're going to show you how to nearly effortlessly, that's in parentheses, grow your audience by nurturing it through email lists. And I have a fun guest with me today, uh, Melissa, who we're going to talk about this. We're going to dive into all of the things that I hate. We're going to talk about sales pages and email copy and writing emails, but I hate it because I know I have to do it and you have to do it too. So join me. Let's get some information and knowledge out of this episode. So before we dive in though, Melissa, welcome to the show. Yeah. Hi, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm excited. I, I know I really uh, I talked you up there about how much I hate this topic, but it's <laughs> it is a very important topic, and I think it's it's something that everybody has a tactic or a strategy around email marketing, and there's gadgets and softwares all over the place, and it's confusing to be honest with you. That's why personally I can't stand it because everybody has their way, and I'm hoping you can simplify it for mostly me, but also our listeners today. And I'm I'm very excited to dive in. So why don't you tell me what what is your area in the world of email marketing and marketing in general? Yeah, so I'm a copywriter and a marketing strategist, and I specialize in sales pages, launches, website copy, and email marketing. And there is a lot of strategy involved with everything that you have to tweak a little bit depending on your client, depending on your audience, and depending on the project. But the strategy is one of my favorite things about the work I do, um, just because it's not, even though you have a lot of the same principles in place, it's not gonna be cookie cutter every single time. So it doesn't necessarily feel monotonous to me, but I know that so many people really shy away from writing their own copy, because especially writing something like a sales page in your own website for the first time, is really daunting because it's a lot of words and it should be structured a certain way so it flows a little bit better then you wanna have the right testimonials and then you wanna make sure that like it looks okay because you can have a great design but if the words aren't resonating with people then nobody's going to buy and then you're gonna have to probably start from scratch which nobody wants to do and that's where people give up right because it's like oh, i put in all this work and now you're telling me it doesn't work and i have to redo it no pass mm -hmm. yeah yeah especially when some sales pages i've written are like four thousand ish words it's just depending on the offer because usually the more money the client is spending then you usually have to make it a little bit longer to make sure you hit all their objections and all their pain points, um, which sounds like a lot. And it is. But like once you figure out like your own style and know what information you need, it it is a lot easier from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I'm always curious and maybe it's a personality type thing. But for me, when I see a long sales page and also maybe it's because I'm I, I write them and I'm an entrepreneur, so I understand what it is, but I don't read all the words. I really just like look at the headline and see if that's going to solve my pain point or provide the solution. Do people read the full page or how do you, how do you structure a page really so that it gets the most effect for people? That's a great question because to be honest, no, most people will not eat, read a full sales page, but that's why it's written the way it is. Because you want to make sure, so say you have an ideal client that's like a 30-year-old mompreneur who started a coaching business, but she hasn't hit her first 5K yet. That's really specific. But that ideal client, they can be driven by different things. They can be very analytical. Like I'm an analytical buyer, so I need to know the price. I need to know the modules. I need to know exactly what I'm getting into. I need to see really specific results that feel realistic. And I need to know all the details before I make a decision, but some people are more emotionally driven and they want to know, okay, this is what the result is. I just wanna see if this person is the right fit for me. Some people are a um, little bit more assertive. They know X, they need to know X, Y, and Z, and that's all they look at. And then they make a decision from there. So you have to have um, a strategy in place to kind of weave in those conversion techniques to make sure you're talking to the same person driven by different factors at once if that makes sense. So that's why you start off with the storytelling, really painting the picture in the beginning of the sales page. Cause you do have to have a really strong headline and a really strong hook. But if it's something for like a coaching membership, for example, you don't want to give away the title of it just yet because you want them to feel like, you know what it's like to be in their shoes. So you're talking about the problem, you're aggravating the pain points, but not to the point where they're like, yeah, why do you have to remind me? Like, I, I know that I'm struggling. <laughs> you don't have to hit me so hard with it. And then just kind of really empathize, empathize with them. 
And then you start talking about like, well, there's actually is a solution. This is possible and you won't be stuck in your current situation anymore. And then you want to introduce the offer and then you want to introduce yourself a bit. And there are other sections of like the modules or the features, the bonuses, um, the price stack, of course, and everything in your FAQ section should be an objection that people are going to have if they read the sales page from top to bottom. So all the information that they need, if they just go to the FAQ, they should have everything that they need to know right there anyways. And also with your crossheads and when you're emphasizing certain copy, like when you're bolding things, underlining them, uh, make them fonts bigger or smaller, you want those pieces of copy to really stand out because if someone is skimming the sales page and only reading the bolded parts of the bigger text, they're still going to learn the same information as if they read the whole thing. So you're kind of, in a way, it's not necessarily repetitive, um, but you're just trying to get your point across. And if that takes 3,000 words, that's okay. If it takes 1,000 words, that's okay. It just really depends on the offer. It's, it's so interesting. And this is this is exactly why I hate it because there's, <laughs> there's so much science to it that I, yeah. I know for sure we can we can have a whole episode breaking down the science of good copy and, and of a sales page and of a funnel. Um, that is not the promise that we've offered on this episode. So I already know, I can tell you know your stuff and you're an expert in this. I'd love to have you back. So we'll just put that as a little teaser for the episode. But <laughs> we did promise bigger. how to nearly effortlessly, in, in quotes, um, nurture your audience and improve your sales. So tell me, first of all, how you go about doing that. I'm assuming we're talking more about emails than sales pages. Mm -hmm. um, but what is what does this look like? How do you do this for your clients? So I'm a big fan of serving in market research because any copywriter that's written at least a couple of projects will tell you if you don't do enough research and you just try to sit down and write everything, it's not going to happen because you get really bad writer's blog. If you do the discovery phase of the research phase correctly, then everything else becomes a lot easier. So once you start building an email list and it doesn't have to be a thousand, ten thousand subscribers. Say you only have a list of like one to four hundred people. That's still probably enough people that are reading your emails, are clicking your links, and that do expect to learn something from you. Just ask them questions, <laughs> and it doesn't have to be a um, really substantial survey. Um, like recently, I created a digital product. It's some welcome email sequence templates, and I created them for the purpose of making them like a paid digital product. But I knew I wanted to refine them a bit, but I needed more market research to get that done. So I put it in a bundle um, and it was, ended up being a free product. And then I attached a survey at the end of my welcome email sequence and said, hey, if you have a couple of minutes, I would love for you to take uh, answer a few questions in this survey. And then as a thank you, once I upgrade the templates and make them better, then you'll get a free the free upgraded version instead of having to pay for it. And I ended up getting um, more responses than I thought I would. And um, they were pretty helpful. And I ended up making a lot of changes. But it was it was nice because we are so close to our offers that, yes, we're very good at what we do. But sometimes something might not be as clear as we thought it was. And it takes someone else saying, well, I didn't buy because module two doesn't seem necessary. Like, I don't think it's helpful when it actually has a lot of value. But if people are willing to give you a little bit of feedback, it can really go a long way. And it doesn't have to be just with lead magnets. It can be with uh, following up with clients maybe um, a month or so just to see like how they're doing ever if with everything. If you have a course, um, having like a pre-course questionnaire is really cool because you get to see exactly where they, they're at on day one. And then they can take a similar or the exact same survey um, three months later whenever the cohort is over. And you can really see firsthand what their results were. And it's for number one, it's great for testimonials because <laughs> they're very specific in testimonials. Um, I think quality is a lot better than quantity because I don't like seeing a bunch of screenshots of testimonials or just saying like, oh yeah, this is great. I highly recommend this because it doesn't say why. <laughs> and a great testimonial will say, yeah, this helped me hit my first 10K month, for example. Like my life has completely changed. Like you want more testimonials like that. And by serving people and just asking them questions, and phrasing them in a certain way, you're able to take those answers out of people because if you've really helped someone, I think most people are really willing to give a testimony, but they're not quite sure what to say. So just asking them, well, what can you do now that you couldn't do three months ago that where you were really struggling, for example, and people are, are more than happy to say, yeah, this person helped me out with um, my financial goals, like my business is doing great. I couldn't have done it without them. And that's a great testimonial to have. 
And when you have that incorporated into your copy, say like in for a launch, for example, there's usually an email in the launch sequence that has um, FAQs, answers, and that has testimonials, for example. If the person reading it wants that result and they see the transformation in someone who had a similar struggle or is having the same struggle as them right now, then that's a lot more appealing than just saying like, yeah, I can help you do X, Y, and Z, pay me $5,000, <laughs> whatever it is. Because uh, if people don't connect with their cop at the end of the day, then they're not going to want to buy it because we're being sold to all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that's, that's the biggest struggle with, with both emails and sales pages is the, the balance between I can help you and I want to sell you. How mm -hmm. do you, especially in emails, because I think that the inbox is now more competitive than ever. Um, and that's why we see people moving to even texting, text marketing, which I think is like crazy. I'm not that old. I swear. If you're just listening and you're not <laughs> watching this, I'm, <laughs> I'm not that old, but I get people blowing up my phone with, with marketing texts. And I'm like, this has to stop. So yeah. how do you, how do you balance that when you're writing copy? That's a great question. Um, I have seen a shift in the last couple of years. I've been a copywriter for three years and I've been running my business full time for two. And what I've seen lately, it's more of an, I guess, ethical approach to sales. Because if you look at some classic ads, um, most of the time the pain points are aggravated a lot. And usually the headlines are like super clever, really witty and fun to read, but they're written in a much different style than most headlines and most body copy is now. But I like it because we're being sold to so much. It's going to take more than a huge promise, for example, to sell to us. We want to get to know the business. We want to know exactly who we're buying from. And we need to buy with them in some level um, because so many other people are doing the same thing. So that's why I have research calls with clients because especially like for launches when I'm writing all these emails, um, you can really get to know a client's process and their transformation. You're hearing it basically firsthand because the client can tell you, yeah, I've helped um, my coaching clients hit 10, 15 K months. But when you're hearing it firsthand from that person and like in a 20 minute research call, for example, you get way more snippets of copy that I call key phrases and I organize them in a certain document. And they're great for the sales pages. They're great for testimonials, but they're great for writing the emails too and just creating the theme for everything. Just listening to what your clients have to say about you, why they love working with you. That's why I have um, copy project feedback forms, which is essentially like a testimonial form, but it's such a nice way to see how you really help someone um, and how you can potentially improve your services too. But really it's just listening to my clients' clients, listening to what my clients have to say, and then just really researching what their competitors are doing because you want to highlight what makes you unique, even if it's something as simple as um, something that's this, your frameworks, their process is the same as everybody else's, but your framework might have a different title or might be slightly different because sometimes it just comes down to personality. <laughs> yeah, that, and that's such a good tip too because like, a lot of times you see these these massive promises. I, I make fun of them all the time. If you're a regular listener and subscriber, um, you've heard me make fun of the, the most recent one, which was we're tired of 10x. Now I've seen 11x your business. And it's like, <laughs> no, just no, we, we're not we're not going there. But hearing it from not only your clients, but your clients clients perspective, you you must get like just so much more in depth. And like you said, valuable copy that you can then use and it's from the end user so it will mm -hmm. connect with the person that you are trying to serve and sell to in your copy i think that's that's a tip that, that that's a tip for the show we should just stop right there <laughs> but we're not going to <laughs> but no that's seriously that's awesome so then can you walk me through a little bit um how, how can as a business owner an entrepreneur maybe we don't have the skills to do this i don't have the skills to do this i'm projecting this on my audience i'm sorry but how do you effortlessly nurture your audience? I think that's the part that's the word effortlessly that I'm really hung up on because if you even tell me to go into my email marketing software, that's not effortless. Just logging in for me is not effortless. <laughs> it's, it's a headache to think about it. So um, I'm being dramatic, but seriously, how, how can we make this process effortless so we are actually nurturing our audience and not bothering them? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also a big fan of segmentation. 
And if he can do it as early on as possible and like your lead magnets welcome email sequence, for example, that's the perfect place to do it because you might have um, just different types of people from different businesses, for example, on your email list. And if they can answer, if they can open an email of yours and just click, say there's four different links. The first one is I'm a new business owner and I've been in business for two uh, less than a year, for example. Another link is I'm a seasoned business owner making consistent revenue, looking to scale. Another one is, well, I'm neither. And then you can ask them to reply. Just by clicking those links, um, it depends on your ESP and your email service provider how to set it up. But once you set up the segmentation, all they have to do is click that link and they should be grouped for that certain link. So if you're writing an email that's more specific to someone who's brand new in business, you're not gonna want to send it to everybody else because it's not gonna relate to them and they're probably not gonna read them. So you wanna get more specific and just really tailor that content to that group of people uh, because then they're gonna resonate with that more and they're gonna connect with you more and they're a lot more likely to become a client of yours or to buy one of your products, for example, because you're being more specific to them rather than trying to write the same type of content to a bunch of different types of people. And if you want to talk to one audience a little bit more than the other, that's completely okay too. Like not everybody has to get every single email of yours. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people need to understand, um, myself included, because the frequency of emails is going to, I guess, make up a lot of how engaged people are. If they get an email from you every single day, there's no way they're reading it. I, I think that would just be crazy to assume. So how do you balance the the frequency with the segmentation, with the overall list? And, and then you're writing different messages to different segments. It seems very complicated, but how do you kind of break that down? And is there a science behind it or is it just kind of know your audience and go by feel? Oh, you could really go either way, to be honest. Um, I think once your audience is segmented, then you can kind of pick and choose. Like, okay, well, I, I like to write to my email list once a week, for example. And sometimes oh, I have oh, a, a, yeah, yeah, to the whole list. Because uh, my list is fairly small right now. But um, yesterday I sent an email to the majority of my list. But anyways, <laughs> uh, I send an email out to my list every single week. And I don't think you have to sell in every single email. And that's somewhat controversial because I'm a, I'm a copywriter. But I think sometimes people just need to hear from you and just kind of trust you and being just a little bit vulnerable with them. A lot of times people appreciate that. And one thing I talk about a lot in, to my own list is like, Obviously, I love hearing people's success stories, but I think it would be beneficial if we can hear people's actual struggles too. Because then when you're stuck, you're not so like, oh, well, why am I not doing that yet? It's Because it's so easy to compare yourself to someone that maybe has the same experience as you or maybe has been, uh, is in the same industry as you. Um, so I just kind of let my thoughts just kind of flow from there. Your emails don't have to follow, especially like if it's just a nurture email, you're just talking to a group on your list and you're not actively selling something it doesn't have to be formatted super pretty you can have a one sentence paragraph you can have um a couple of words that are bolded or the text is a little bit bigger like i have pictures of my dog all the time just because he's he's really photogenic but just being conversational with people you don't even have to have like, this elaborate story like i had a an email that i sent out a couple of weeks ago because uh, my dog was frustrated that i wasn't paying attention to him and he's like whimpering with his paw up so i'm thinking like, what did he, like what happened like did he hurt himself and he's like limping over to me and it turns out he was fine <laughs> he just wanted to hang out with me but like i tied that into business and like, well sometimes we just get caught so caught up doing what we feel like we need to do that we forget that everything else in our life is going on too and we should also dedicate ourselves to it so like the storytelling part doesn't have to be super elaborate it can be something super random like that or something that's a lot more serious and it's up to you for how vulnerable you want to be some people get super vulnerable i just kind of double into it just because i do think it's important to let people know like hey i love what i do and i'd say i'm good at it but there i've done a lot of things backwards just because i didn't have any experience in in what i started and so emails don't have to be very long um sometimes they can be just a handful of paragraphs but as long as you're getting your point across and people see that you're a real person and they can trust you a little bit when you do send out that email with a big call to action, um, then it's going to be an easier sell. I, yeah, that's a great tip. Be a real person. And you, your dog sounds a lot like my dog. Um, I'm hoping you and the audience can't hear him, but he's scratching 
at my door, I hear him. So, <laughs> so I'm going to go write an email. That's that's what I, I took from this. So now that I have my email, I think the next issue comes up for me and I'm going to put it on the screen because we don't have time to dive into it. But what do I put in the subject line so people open the email? <laughs> so this, we got to wrap this episode up. Melissa, this has been fantastic. But why don't you tell us a little bit about what's on the screen and how we can learn from you how to write the perfect subject line? Yeah, so I have a lead magnet. It's called um, 10 Subject Line Formulas for Attention Grabbing Emails. And the inspiration for it is, is that I always do my headlines and my subject lines last just because I feel like I overthink them. So I thought, well, if I struggle with this as a copywriter, <laughs> I'm sure other people need help with this too. So um, some pretty easy to use formulas, uh, one best to use them, and also some additional tips to like build your authority and build your credibility too. That is super cool. Well, I'm going to be on your email list because I'm going to go download it. So I'll see, <laughs> I'll get to see what you write emails about and maybe I'll see the one about your dog too. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. This has been really, really informative episode. I would love to have you back, like I said, to analyze sales page copy. I think that is a different art. It is a different science. It's one I hate equally as much as email copy, but that's okay. We're going to get through it. I learned a lot from this episode. I hope you did watching and listening. Um, Melissa, yeah, thank you again for coming. This has been fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. I can't wait to come back. <laughs> awesome. All right. For those of you watching, listening, whatever platform you're on, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a second of this totally ridiculous show where hopefully we give you a little bit of an insight into your business, how to help you, how to solve a problem, how to grow your business, whatever that may be. That's the goal. We're here to disrupt the way you think about your business so you can grow and scale effortlessly and not do it like me the hard way. Please don't do that. But anyway, <laughs> we'll see you next time on Harmonious at Lunch. This has been too much fun. Make